everyone, and welcome to a, another event as a part of the High Peaks Festival New Year's Reunion Bash. We're so excited to have you all here with us tonight. My name is Carolyn Regula, and I will be your host today. All of our sessions are being recorded and will also be live streamed on YouTube. All of our master classes and presentations will be available after each session on our YouTube channel. Berkshire High Peaks Festival is a part of the Close Encounters with Music. The mission of Close Encounters is to engage the imagination of diverse concert audiences in a welcoming setting, to connect listeners to performers and composers and foster the excitement and sense of community that live performance builds and to establish a comfortable listening environment, turning performances into enriching and educational experiences. Now, if you have any questions for our guest speaker tonight, you can submit those questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you would like to talk amongst yourselves, feel free to use the chat window, but I will be looking in the Q&A feature to relay your questions to our guest. I say guest, but in reality, it is an honor to introduce the artistic director for his talk on interpretation. He's the artistic director of Close Encounters as well as renowned cellist Yehuda Hanani. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for this introduction. Um, this is a subject, of course, that concerns all of us, singers, dancers, actors, interpretation. Unlike paintings that can fade with the passing years, lose their luster, or frescoes that develop cracks and crumble, like Da Vinci's Last Supper, which is almost gone by now. The wonder of classical music is that it is kept dazzlingly alive and fresh through its constant reinterpretation by living performers. Each performance is a revival, a rebirth, and is therefore a great responsibility. Interpretation brings together many layers, historical, cultural information, structural understanding of the language of music and its grammar, personal insights, imagination, and intuition. There is an old joke about parents who send their son to college in a faraway town and he disappears, there's no, no sign from him for months, a total silence. A year later, a telegram arrives, tells you how old this joke is, and it contains two words, father money. Father is furious. Total silence for a whole year, and then father money. The mother takes a look at the telegram and she says, no, no. That's not what it says. It says, Father, money. To begin, there is terminology. From the Baroque period on, composers have supplied us with increasing instructions and clues related to tempo and to mood. So, Furioso, agitato, con fuoco, would be father money. And molto dolce, con sentimento, affettuoso, tranquillo, would be the mother's interpretation. We have to make sure to understand all the Italian below and above the notes, and later on, the German, in late Beethoven and Schumann, and later yet, the French in Debussy and Ravel. So you may find out, find out that uh, Allegro in Italian means 
cheerful, not fast, and has evolved by musicians, by us, as an indication of speed. When Beethoven writes in his Opus 95 Quartet, Allegro assai vivace ma serioso, it is a reminder not to consider the original meaning of Allegro, which otherwise would be cheerful, vivacious, but serious, sending absurd mixed signal. And that adagio molto mesto does not mean a messy adagio, but a sad and pensive one. In general, you should have unending curiosity for information, background, clues. The music of Shostakovich, for example, cannot be properly understood and interpreted without the knowledge of the nightmarish Stalinist terror under which he lived and created. Mm. Mendelssohn, Second Quartet, Opus 13, begins with a quote from a love song he wrote for a young lady. And the entire quartet concludes with the complete song. Ist es wahr? Ist es wahr? La, ra, 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 ra. Is it true? Is it so? That you stood there in the garden, surrounded by foliage and so on. This information is not peripheral and would make us play the movement differently. An amusing story I heard from my colleague Shmuel Ashkenazi, first prize winner in the Tchaikovsky competition and founder of the Vermeer Quartet. In the short Cavatina of Beethoven's Quartet Opus 130, there is a rare indication from the composer it appears only once in the entire book of quartets and, to my knowledge, nowhere else. And it is directed only at the first violin and only for one phrase, eight bars to be exact. Beklempt, meaning choked with emotion, suffocated. An ignorant critic reviewing the Vermeer concert where they played the piece wrote, in the middle of the cavatina, the violinist had serious problems with his tone and sounded completely choked and suffocated. What was intended as a nasty dig ended up a great compliment. Let's get more concrete. You're assigned a piece of music you have never heard before. What is the first thing you do? Most students, also many professionals, of course, go to the library and listen to a CD of the work. The gains are obvious. Without any effort, you get an instant picture of the piece and its layout. But this picture has been painted by someone else. They have come between you and the composer and kept you from the struggle and the thrill of finding your own personal solution to artistic and structural questions, of establishing your own immediate dialogue with the composer. It might even stifle your imagination. Gustave Flaubert, the great French author of Madame Bovary and other works, refused throughout his life to allow any illustrations to accompany his work because he thought that pictorial images reduced the universal to the singular. He wanted each reader to form their mental picture based on the text. No one will ever illustrate me while I'm still alive, 
very strong statement from an author. What would he say today about the movie versions of so many great novels? The Bible. The book is better than the movie. Just like studying a musical score, reading a literary masterpiece is work. And you slowly internalize the characters as the plot and they evolve. All the violinists, the great violinists of the past predated the CD industry. Joseph Sigeti, Yehudi Menuhin, Fritz Kreisler, Misha Elman, and for that matter, great pianists like Artur Schnabel. They all had a personal, immediately recognizable voice that sounded like no other. The word diversity is on everyone's lips these days. But unfortunately, many contemporary players are boringly alike. Is the CD industry to blame or teaching, which has become technically oriented and rigid, regimented? Misha Elman was king of the violin for decades until Yasha Heifetz appeared on the scene. He possessed old world charm, a miraculous bow arm, and a legendary sound on the fiddle. Here is the opening phrase, or a few phrases, of Dvorak's humoresque, which he recorded in 1910, 110 years ago. Let's listen. Thank you, Carolyn. Let's stop right here. It certainly evokes another world, doesn't it? Now, why don't we compare it to Fritz Kreisler's rendition of the very same part of the humoresque. It so happens that his recording also was done in 1910, same year as Michel Elman. I wonder what you think and how you feel about these delicious expressive slides. Now, what happens when Misha Elman takes the same approach, the same tradition, <clears throat> and plays a Beethoven minuet?
He recorded the Minuet at age 70, celebrating 50 years of a glorious career. Is it stylistically correct? A Beethoven scholar would tear his hair out. But any reservations will be melted away by his irresistible charm, this captivating elegance and tenderness and imagination. All the same, any attempt at copying it, at mimicking it, would be disastrous. It is so individualistic, so personal, that it would come across as counterfeit or a poor knockoff. So yes, listen to other works by the composer you are studying it. Schubert songs, if you are an instrumentalist. Schubert quartet, if you are a singer. Beethoven symphonies, if you are studying or working on one of his sonatas. Get to know the composer, his personality, his language, but avoid listening to the piece on your music stand. Only after spending a great deal of time with a piece, after owning it, it could be interesting to see how others, other players, are approaching um, whatever the challenge was and what their solution are, solutions are. It would also be a mistake to copy yourself. Let's say you played a recital last month and you really like what you hear when you hear the recording of it. And you say to yourself, I am just going to make a copy, almost a Xerox copy of this performance and deliver it again tonight. Don't do that. Because first of all, it will inhibit your creativity. And then nothing is the same. What was last month was last month. Today you are different. The audience will be different. The acoustics in the room will be different and the piece has to be reborn again in a spontaneous fashion by you. you know, we, we just have to remember that we, we have the process, the magical alchemist process of bringing a piece from the page, from the printed page to life again. A few years back I was giving a master class in Tokyo. A student was playing Bach suite and I was making some suggestions, some possibilities showing uh, alternatives. And she looked bewildered and she said, but that is not what you do on your CD. And actually it was a very co great compliment for me. You never repeat yourself twice. Our composers, the final arbiters of their compositions. Over the years, dozens of composers have written works for me. In some cases, their participation, their input, served as a helpful guide. Having them during rehearsals, hearing their comments. In many other cases, like the concerto by Joan Tower. I premiered in Aspen uh, quite a few years back. It was left to me to put the piece together, rehearsing with the pianist who played the reduction of the orchestral part. Joan came to the premiere in Aspen 
and took a bow with me together. Um, it so happens that Carolyn is studying the piece right now, and I left it to her to choose a quote from this very powerful concerto for cello and orchestra. Maybe we should stop here. This is really a very intense dialogue between cello and orchestra. It's more a piece of chamber music than a concerto, which I'm sure this was her intention. So she called it music for cello and orchestra rather than a concerto. So let's return back to our question. Do composers really have the final say? And how far can they go with micromanaging their creations once they are released to the world. Beethoven, after losing his hearing, writes in metronome markings that he hears in his head with his mind's ears, but that are not necessarily playable or realizable by mortal performers. Shostakovich, late in life, changed a good number of metronome indications. So which do we follow, the early edition or the later one? My dear friend Paul Schoenfeld actually advised me not to take the metronome markings of his popular cafe music literally. Tchaikovsky was not an inspiring conductor being timid and tentative, and was responsible for the failure of many of the premieres of his pieces which he conducted. I had the great fortune of being Aaron Copland's soloist when he conducted the San Antonio Symphony. 
apart from the cello concerto, which was Shalomo by Bloch. The program included Rodeo and Appalachian Spring. After the rehearsal over an Italian dinner, he was frank enough to say, I don't know why I'm invited to conduct my works. Lenny does it so much better. Lenny is Leonard Bernstein, and he was right. Of course, everyone wanted to be able to tell their grandchildren that they saw Aaron Copeland conducting his works. It may sound paradoxical, since our main goal is, as performers, is to execute the vision of the composer with fidelity. Sometimes they just need a little help. One more example before we move on is Claude Debussy. He left us with a number of wax cylinder recordings of his piano works himself playing, which are of course of great interest. But you would be better off going to a museum and absorbing the world of great impressionist painters to better understand and play his music. What Claude Monet does with pigment, Claude Debussy attempts acoustically. He paints with sound. A powerful interpretation by a great artist may override the intentions of the composer. Yes, you heard me say that. Robert Schumann attended a concert in Weimar where Franz Liszt was playing his music. And he wrote home to his wife, Clara, and I'm quoting, he is quite extraordinary. He played from the novelettes, the fantasy, the sonata moving me deeply. Many things were different from the way I had imagined them. But this was playing of genius with tenderness and boldness of emotion, etc., etc. There you have the force of a convincing interpretation and the great Schumann conceding another vision, another possibility. The historical approach to interpretation is perplexing and peculiar. We have made almost a religion of returning to Baroque practice and many music school schools have separate departments dedicated to it. But as, you, as we have seen already, playing styles change with each generation. Why do we go back 300 years and skip what happened in between? Here is a recording from 1902 by Eugene Isai, the great violinist, Belgian violinist, a contemporary of Brahms. Let's listen.
Okay, Colin, thank you. I, di I did not have the heart to stop this recording in the middle. Of course, it was the prize song from Die Meistersinger by Wagner. In spite of the primitive quality of the recording technology of the time, you can get this idea of unbelievably pristine intonation, long lines, honesty of, in, of, of expression. It's astonishing. But shall we insist on playing Brahms with no vibrato and the use of these old fashioned slides, which were very much in common practice during Brahms's day? César Frank dedicated his famous violin sonata to Eugenie Sai. It was a birthday gift for him. Shall we play it in this fashion? Is there, isn't there a paradox here? A hundred years from now, our playing style will be considered old fashioned too. My first cello teacher was an elderly British lady who gave me gut strings which had to be rubbed with olive oil to keep them from unraveling. The summer of 1900 was a life-changing one for me, spent at the Marlboro Festival as a student with Pablo Casals teaching and conducting. There he was in his early 90s, a man who overlapped with Brahms and Sanz, Tchaikovsky, you name it. A giant of a musician with a 19th century artistic outlook. We recorded with him Schubert's Unfinished Symphony and Mozart's Symphony No. 40 in G minor. How he took a fresh look at an old masterpiece, unhampered by current trends and undulled by the routine of repeated performances was a revelation. His reading had crisp spontaneity and the youthful enthusiasm of a teenager, plus 75 years of being immersed in music. He started the Mozart Symphony with surging waves. And then requested a glissando from the entire orchestra at the emotional turn of the phrase, singing it with his expressive quivering voice. There it was, the legacy of a 19th century slide being used at the end of the 20th century for an expressive purpose, something that no conductor today would do. Let's listen to this unique performance and take it at least until after the beginning of the recapitulation so we can relish this slide a second time.
Nothing commercial, nothing slick about this Marlboro recording. Let's talk about sound. The choice of voice has to merge with the content and character of a piece until they are inseparable. We don't want to play a piece by Manuel de Falla using the same sound as in Schumann. The idea of beautiful sound by itself is meaningless. A pretty wallpaper, or worse, casting Marilyn Monroe as Mother Teresa. The French cellist Paul Tortelier used to tell his new students, if you want a beautiful sound, go to my wife, Maud. Her sound is prettier than mine. But boy, was he a formidable artist. Here are two examples of miscasting. Fyodor Shalyapin, the great Russian basso, gives you goosebumps when he sings Boris Godunov by Mussorgsky or Russian songs by Glinka. His performances are unbelievable. They are legendary. But the world of Mozart is culturally alien to his Russian training and his Slavic soul. See if you can recognize this aria from Don Giovanni, or even recognize that this was written by Mozart. Granted, this is Leporello, who is a comic figure at this point, counting the many, many conquests, love affairs of his master, Don Giovanni. Um, it's called the Catalogue Aria. But if you disregard the, the primitive quality of the core recording again, it comes close to a parody of a Mozart opera. The other example is a most beautiful soprano, operatic soprano, the voice of Martina Arroyo. 
She was a diva at the Met, and we were quite friendly. We were performed together on a number of musical cruises. And during one of these journeys, she fell in love with our eight-year-old son and gave him her CD of spirituals. In this case, her operatic training prevents her from producing the gripping black gospel sound. And she turns the spirituals into art songs, in spite of being African-American herself. Let's listen to one or two of these uh, spirituals. Skipping an octave at the end and giving us this operatic high note. That's not in the nature of a spiritual. Let's hear another one. Here again, we have the famous high note that an opera diva would produce. And of course, the, the piano arrangement also does not contribute to the correct spirit of a spiritual. Whoever did the arrangement is a fine musician, but he missed the direction 
the music should have taken. One of my favorite artists is Louis Armstrong. Here is a case where the voice and the musical material are one and the same, whether he sings, whether he plays the trumpet, or does his famous scatting, it's just one unit. Let's hear a little bit of this unique voice and how it fits what he sings. I see trees of green. I see them blue for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue, clouds of white. Bright blessed days, dark sacred nights, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky. Also on the faces of people going by, I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies crying. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know And I think to myself What a wonderful world Yes, I think to myself What a wonderful world. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Carolyn. Mm, gives me the shivers. So much for beautiful voices. Let's pursue meaningful ones, all of us. How about repetitions? As performers, how do we handle phrases that repeat before minimalism turned repetition into a numbing, hypn hypnotizing mantra? How do we justify saying or playing something two or three times. Does the composer intend it for further emphasis or for changing new ones? The use of dynamics alone to create variety would sound artificial, mechanical, like turning the volume up or down on the radio and using an echo effect by definition stops the flow while we listen for the echo to return and then resume forward motion. So, in general, echo should be used cautiously and judiciously. Gertrude Stein said, you don't repeat, you insist, which is one option. At the end of King Lear, the flawed, tragic king has lost everything, including his mind, as well as Cordelia, the one daughter who was true to him. Her death penetrates 
his dimmed mind as he holds her in his arms. No. No. No life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life? And thou, no breath at all. Thou'lt come no more. Never. 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 Five times. A mere crescendo or diminuendo would miss the tragic moment entirely. And here is a parallel from a great musical work, Mahler's Song of the Earth, Das Lied von der Erde. The piece is more than one hour long, an impassioned, lingering farewell to life and its joys and the realization of the necessity of renunciation. It is based on loose translation of poetry by the great, probably one of the greatest Chinese poets, Li Taipei or Li Po, from the seventh century, Tsang Dynasty. And here it's, this is how it ends. Everywhere, oh no, I want to start a little earlier. Still is my life. Scratch this. I'm getting too excited. Still is my heart. It is awaiting its hour. Everywhere the lovely earth blossoms forth in spring and grows green and new. Everywhere Forever, horizons are blue and bright. Forever and ever and ever. Five times here, too. Bruno Walter, the great conductor, and Kathleen Furrier, the singer. Take us beyond this world into timelessness with these repetitions, of course, with the help of the great Mahler. Let us listen to this, the ending of an amazing piece of music.
need to take a deep breath after this. The German word for forever is ewig, which you heard repeated. Fading sort of into a cosmic endlessness, eternity. Now, when COVID is still raging, the COVID is still raging, you have the extra time. Do take an hour and listen to the entire piece. It has a cathartic element in it. It'll make you feel different, I guarantee it. Tastes will continue to change. Trends will come and go. Tempo will fluctuate with the temperament of different artists. Every generation will attempt to approximate the platonic perfection of Bach in its own way. It will continue to be relevant, not because it was written for harpsichord and gut strings, but in spite of it. It transcends historical boundaries and Baroque setups. If in doubt, listen to Glenn Gould playing the Goldberg variations on the modern piano. Shakespeare plays are receiving Freudian readings undreamed of during the Elizabethan age. And changing political climate in recent years has even turned one of them, the Tempest, upside down. The idealized figure of Prospero has begun to be read as the colonial exploiter of the indigenous population of what the text calls an uninhabited island. An island already inhabited by Caliban and his mother, drawing obvious parallels to North and South American history and turning Shakespeare's message topsy-turvy. Slides and vibrato on strings and the use of pedal on the piano will also follow the style of the day, along with hairdos and fashion. So, we might as well focus on what will never change, harmonic relationships and progressions, the buildup of tension and its release, the number of bars in a phrase, the character of various dance forms, the voices in the fugue, the grammar and syntax of the musical language. There are numerous ways to interpret Hamlet's monologue, but to be or not, to be that is the question, will never work. Other things that will forever remain. The challenge of attending to details without losing the big line or rendering the big line without omitting the details. The subtlety and vitality of rhythm and cross rhythms. The function and execution of notes that both end one phrase and begin another. My students know I call these notes Janus notes. Janus, the Roman god of doorways and gates, who has two faces, one in the front and one in the back, a two-faced note. The gamut of human experience and emotions, hope, passions, fears, joys, longing that we are trying to express. And finally, the mystery of time in music. We enter a parallel universe where, unlike scientific time on the clock, which is regular, even, and unchanged, time in music slows down, speeds up, and stops. More amazing yet, it flows forward and backward simultaneously. One and two and three and four and five, five and four and three and two and one, forward again. Pa -da -pa -pi -a -da -da. It coils back and springs forward. When a person returns home from a journey, he or she returns to a physical place. 
But when we say the theme returns, recapitulation or the conclusion of theme and variations, it returns in time. We are 20 or 30 minutes from the opening, but the theme has traveled elliptically and returned to this point again. And what will the nature of the homecoming be? Heroic, celebratory, wiser, humble, like the returning prodigal son on his knees, or elevated, like Beethoven's Diabelli variations, where a crude theme returns an hour later ennobled by the journey and its lessons. I wish you all a wondrous journey full of revelations in this magical universe of music. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hanani, for chanting journey through so um, music history, different mediums of music. It was it was really beautiful. And, I, and, and a bit confusing, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 a lot of beautiful things to take in. A lot, yes, but all wonderful. I'm sure. Our viewers might need a moment if they have any questions for you. Um, now is the time. I would love to um, ask something to kind of give people some time if they have any thoughts. But one thing I'd be curious with your take on, and I kind of know the answer because we've discussed this in our lessons, but I want you to give the chance to share it. How should a student go about if they're really passionate about a certain interpretation or a certain idea, but they have a mentor that they really respect and their teacher doesn't quite see the interpretation that way? When a student has a different idea, how can they convince their teacher? I welcome different ideas from my students. Actually, I encourage dissent. I like it when they disagree with me, but their disagreement or their original thinking or their own ideas have to be based on structural information. Uh, as I just de demonstrated with the Hamlet phrase, you cannot just come for a lesson and change the grammar of the sentence to a point where it makes no sense. So there's got to be the understanding. And within this understanding, within the correct grammar, there are still multitude ways to feel a phrase. Uh, so I have, I'm very respectful of students' ideas and thoughts, but I insist that they are based on knowledge, on understanding, and um, as you know very well. I'm <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I don't see any questions from our audience. I think. They're, they're in wonder right now, maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll leave you to give any closing remarks you would like. And if we get any last minute submissions, I'll let you know. But in case not, is there anything you'd like to say um, to close out for our viewers? Well, I think I said pretty much everything I had to say. Just uh, we should all take advantage of this period where we are isolated, where we have time to think, to ponder, to contemplate, to study scores, and really come up with original thoughts and original ideas. So, including listening to Mahler's Song of the Earth and many other great masterpieces that during normal daily life, as you know, as a student too, there's just not a time for it. So I would take advantage of this period where the days stretch and we don't even know which day of the week it is sometimes and, and try to absorb as much as possible. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mr. Hanani. I mean, I say Mr. because I'm still your student, of course, but not for long, Carolyn, you will become a colleague soon. <laughs> Fantastic. Can't wait. <laughs> uh, well, thank you to everybody. 
everybody who joined us tonight, everybody who is watching. And before we close out, I do want to put in our chat a link that will show you all the rest of our talks going on until January 5th. We have one more event tonight, a masterclass with Alexander Starkman of High Peaks faculty and the Peabody Conservatory of Music. But we have events, like I said, until the 5th, and you can check that out on the High Peaks website. And again, that link is in the chat for you. Thank you all so much for watching. Again, thank you to Mr. Hanani. And if we don't see you later tonight at eight o'clock, then we hope to see you tomorrow or Tuesday. So you. yes, <laughs> have a wonderful, fabulous night, everybody. And we'll say goodbye only for now. <laughs>